welcome. I'm Ashley Burgess, and you're watching the Celebrity Perspective Texas Edition. And I'm right here in Dallas, Texas, right downtown. Right behind me, you can see downtown Dallas, and you can see the buildings right here. And I thought no place better than to interview somebody that I respect and looked up to, Cynthia Smoot. Cynthia, thank you for joining me here live on the Celebrity Perspective. Thanks for having me, and thanks for that kind introduction. Hey, you're welcome. I'm just glad to have you. So let's start today, because you are a, a Texas native, right? I am. I was born in Lampasas, Texas, grew up in Denison, and have lived in Dallas for about 25 plus years. Nice. Okay, cool. So you are an official Dallasite for sure. Yes. So what is your favorite thing about living in the great state of Texas? I think just the iconic, legendary status that Texas has really all over the world. I mean, we're known for our big hair, big bank accounts, but more so than that, our big personalities. And there are just so many amazing people that have literally blazed trails, you know, created things, companies, inventions that have really changed not only the course of Texans, but people around the world. I agree with you. If you haven't been to Dallas, you haven't been to Texas, you've got to try it out. It's a total in independent state of its own. But I do like it. There's a lot of hustle and bustle, um, like any city, but it is kind of like, uh, to me, almost like a new city, almost like a small town in Dallas. I say Dallas is the biggest small town ever. Like the, it, it feels like this huge cosmopolitan city, and yet everywhere you go, you run into people that you know. It's literally like that six degrees of Kevin Bacon. <laughs> I love that game. You got to be really careful what you say to who, because it will get back. Somebody knows somebody everywhere you go. You're exactly right. <laughs> so tell me a little bit more. I know when I first met you, I remember that you were big into advertising here in, in, in Dallas. Tell me a little bit more about your background career-wise. Sure. So I've worked in marketing for my entire career, 30 plus years. Um, started out in advertising sales for a newspaper, then went to magazines, and then flipped over to the agency side. So my husband and I own a marketing firm. Um, we're a full-service lifestyle agency, so really anything that falls under the marketing umbrella, our agency can provide our clients. I personally handle the public relations and social media marketing aspect of marketing for our clients. So what was your connection with marketing to begin with? I really sort of stumbled into it. I, I had absolutely no plan about what I was going to do with my life and um, actually majored in college in fashion merchandising, clothing and textiles, thinking I would be a buyer or do something with fashion. Um, and I chose that because when my mother said, well, what do you love to do? I said, well, I like to shop. That was literally how I chose, chose my college major, like the worst reason ever. It's hilarious. Uh, and got out, so I got out of college with this degree that I really had no idea what I was going to do with. And, and, you know, the Lord was looking out for me. I really stumbled into this sales job and discovered that I had a talent for talking people into spending their money. Not just my father, but apparently lots of people. So I was a great advertising executive. Cool. And um, you know, ended up being one of the top executives for Village Voice Media, which mm -hmm. owns a conglomerate of alternative news weeklies around the country, and that's really how it started. That's cool. Yeah, that's really cool. So you know, I think a lot of folks out there, you know, have an idea or a thought or a talent or you know, a product. Do you also motivate people? So when you have clients, you know, sometimes people go, "Oh gosh, is this ever going to happen? Is it ever going to take off?" You know, how do you motivate those clients? So I think. You can have the best idea in the world, but until you actually believe in it and see something happen, you get a little, I don't know if disgruntled is a word, but maybe... Well, you like, can have the best idea in the world, and if nobody knows about it, it doesn't do you or anybody else any good. And so I think that's really what I love about working in PR, is that my job is to shine a spotlight on the people, the companies, the services, the products that can really change people's lives um, or just enhance them. So whether that be a beauty product or a great restaurant or a new you know, technology, an app, um, it's really helping people develop their stories. And sometimes what they think is the story turns out to not be the story. Mm -hmm. The story is not necessarily about you and your app. It's about how does that app change people's lives for the better. And so sometimes it's sort of getting them out of their ego and making them see like, this is not all about you. <laughs> this is really about what your product is doing. So you are not going to be the face of this. We're going to take it over here. And um, so it's kind of helping them sometimes get outside, get out of their own way and looking at the bigger picture, giving them some perspective on how they can sell their vision to the world. I love that word. You said my favorite word, perspective. <laughs> And you know, I love perspectives because when you think about it, like we have that perception of life a lot of times, but it's not until we live through life's ups and downs, highs and lows, overcoming adversity, do we create that, I, I like to call it more like an adult perspective. 
But at the same point, I think it's interesting when we go through a life of sometimes hardships and adversity, we literally see a different perspective in our life than we had before. Well, my son's first grade teacher, one of her sayings was, take the best and leave the rest. And I think especially as a parent, that's what you do. You're pulling from your own experience, but then you're also going with your gut on what feels right to you. So I say that to myself a lot in work and in my personal life. Take the best, leave the rest, go with your gut. Let me ask you, how do you really hone in on your gut? Because I have a lot of clients that I, I work with that have neglected their gut instinct for so long that they don't hear it anymore. Mm -hmm. And they literally find themselves in a situation where they can't move or can't act. How do you really resonate with that? Well, I think that's a great point, and I think the first thing you have to do is, is what are you going to do to get back in touch with your feelings and figure out, you know, you have to learn to tune out the voices around you and listen to the voice within you. Okay. And I think that's really hard for a lot of people to do, um, maybe because it's a confidence in you, maybe you don't trust your own voice, and so you find yourself listening to other people who may or may not have the best of intentions for you, or they may have great intentions, but they don't understand your product or your journey. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, that's, that's to me what the Holy Spirit is. It's that voice in coming through you, speaking to you, through your spirit, through your soul, and it's telling you what to do, where to go. You know, I think I've heard so many great entrepreneurs talk about, you know, really daring to be different. And I think, um, I had a therapist say to me recently, you know, if you're doing something that feels uncomfortable, that probably means it's good for you. That's what growth is. Growth mm -hmm. is being uncomfortable. It's getting outside of your box. And so I think especially as an entrepreneur, you have to, I mean, if you're just going with the flow and doing what everybody else is doing, you're mm -hmm. never gonna break out and become a superstar in your industry because what's gonna make your brand elevated is what's different about you. You know, it's why do we need 10 other hairbrushes that do the same thing? I, I want one that's, you know, I just do this and my hair is automatically fabulous, right? So if you've got that, that's what you need to market it as. So I think, you know, people are too afraid to be different sometimes and yet being different is what makes you special and unique and is what's gonna make people be interested in you for your product. I see, I like that and, and, and I agree with you. It's about putting yourself out there. And there's some things that if you feel weird about, you might need to really reflect on what you're doing, you know, to some degree. I mean, if it's around somebody that might be uh, maybe toxic for you or something like that, but you're right. If it's that feeling of, I'm a little scared, uh, you know, and you're putting yourself out there and it's a new experience, I agree with you. And it's like trying to overcome that feeling of butterflies or whatever well, That's it is. that fear of failure. Oh yeah, fear of failure. And some right. people call it the fear of success. Right, exactly. <laughs> so you, you can't succeed without failure because it's through those mistakes that you made is where the beauty and the discovery is gonna lie. You know, I think failure is interesting too. I think a lot of people talk about, you know, well, I failed when I did this or I failed when I did that. But my, my issue with failure is if you've done it, you tried it, did you really fail? Because that's always a funny thing about Because you learned something. What did you learn from that that right. you're now taking to the next thing that's that, gonna help yeah. you succeed? If you didn't do anything, right. I think that's failure. If I get, because I've been there before where you don't do anything, and that, that to me is the real failure, but then you have that, that awful cousin of failure right. called regret, you know? And regret is just, gosh. Well, I, mean, I think that's what I love about working in digital marketing is because the platforms are so new, you know, Facebook, Twitter, they're only 10, 12, 13 years old. This is still such a new and burgeoning industry that, you know, even the experts, they're not really experts because quite frankly, everybody's just trying to figure it out. And not just the how does it work, but how do we make money off of it? What's the result? How are we going to use this to benefit our brand or our company or our platform? And right. so to me, the beauty is that you have the capability to really go in there and play. And even if you screw it up, it's like you're learning something that you can then take to enhance the next campaign or you know the next move on to the next client and that you've learned from so that to me is super exciting that to work in an industry like that where everything is so new and there's new act you know aspects you know even facebook like the, i get you know, half the time every week i sit down and they've changed something and then i'm like i spend a whole day trying to figure out what the heck they just did right <laughs> there's a new facebook algorithm what are we going to do exactly here? what does this mean you know I, I find social media to be good for work for sure but i i wonder where the because I think a lot of people probably watching um, this episode of Celebrity Perspective looks at social media a lot 
maybe uses too much of their time on social media and it can be hard to differentiate real world versus social media sometimes and and I, have you ever been to a birthday party where you're you're there at the party with the birthday girl or birthday boy right. and everybody's about to blow out they're about to blow out the candles and you look down <laughs> and birthday girl or boy is on the phone on facebook and I'm tagging everybody. And you're like, no, I went. I went to a luncheon the other day, and literally every single person, including the birthday girl, had their phone out as the cake was coming over with the sparkler in it. Like nobody was actually enjoying the experience. We're just all documenting it, <laughs> which it was really funny. It actually made for a great Snapchat video, but because um, it, like it was so humorous. But I think you know that's one of the things that I've sort of taken a step back from in the last year is to make more of a concerted effort to not just be so busy documenting life that I'm not living it and realizing that not everything has to be posted live and in the moment. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's okay to just be there to enjoy the party, to really interact with people, and then you can post about it the next day. Like Not everything has to be right in this second. Well, I feel like it divides me out from living. You know, I become, no longer do I become an active participant in life. Now I'm becoming somebody that's watching it. So it's like, you right. know, watching a football game. No, I'm not out there on the field throwing the ball, you know, but I'm becoming a spectator. And it feels like the spectator is now at the birthday party, but I'm not really there because I'm documenting it. But it's not until the next day where you look at the video that you put up there and you go, well, that looks fun. But you know what I also find is that sometimes when I walk into an event, I use social media as a distraction because I'm maybe a little insecure or uncomfortable in that crowd. Maybe I walk into a party and I'm like, okay, I only see one or two people I know. So I immediately pull out my phone because it's a way for me to, like I don't have to talk to anybody because I'm doing a Snapchat video. So it's a way for me to separate myself um, as opposed to you know diving in and just, you know, walking up and introducing myself to people or talking to somebody new. So, you know, I definitely catch myself using it as a crutch. And so sometimes I think it's, you know, it, it's that insecurity. I agree. I mean, I, I, I'm making I, myself I look really important because I'm doing it, but it's really to mask a complete insecurity on my part. Oh, shut, shut. <laughs> Don't talk to me. I'm on my phone. I'm doing some something really important silence. with my Insta story. <laughs> So I think social media for me, while it's this amazing technology and it is a great way to connect with people that you might not see all the time, people who live out of town, out of state, you know, maybe you went to high school with and you still kind of want to keep up with them, right. but not necessarily have lunch. <laughs> um, it's great for that, but I think we have to be really careful about like is, you know, us being friends on Facebook is not the same sort of meaningful interaction that we get when we're doing this, when we're sitting here face to face and I'm feeling your energy and we're having an actual conversation. Yeah, exactly. it, it will never replace that. And so I think that's really important to remember is that human interaction is at the core what humans crave. It's what we need to survive. And, and I agree with you because I think that one of the biggest problems we have in our society, and, and this is the reason why we're doing the show, is the Surgeon General came out and said it's not cancer and it's not heart disease anymore that's the number one killer. It's isolationism and feeling alone. And I think a lot of people feel alone. They feel scared because they don't feel like anybody understands them. And I feel that social media, you know, bridging the conversation to that too, does help us sometimes to keep connected with some folks, but I think to a degree it also isolates us. And it makes you feel inadequate when you are looking at all these, you know, perfect Instagram posts and thinking their marriage looks so perfect, her kitchen looks so beautiful, and my life is a disaster. It makes you feel bad about yourself. Instead of, cel you're, you're trying to celebrate what's good, and at the same time, it, it's not necessarily 100% authentic. Well, it's true, and you don't know how many times it took to take that picture. A lot. Yeah. And we try to raise the bar. We have to, you know, <laughs> look how beautiful she is, look how amazing she is, look at this, look at that. But at the same time, what are we comparing ourselves to? We're comparing ourselves to what that person considered their best at that time. Right. And, and I feel like we lose out on our individuality. I feel like we lose out on our authentic living because we're too busy trying to cookie cutter ourselves into doing that when in reality, if we just step back, and I know this takes years, it took me years to do it, but step back and actually love ourselves for who we are. And it took me a long time to figure out how to do that, you know, because every time I looked in the mirror back in the day, I would see every fault, every problem, every extra pound, every extra zit, everything. 
that I didn't like about myself. See, like you were telling me earlier today that your hair was not doing what you wanted it to do. And <laughs> I'm sitting here looking at you thinking like, I think you have the most beautiful hair. I would trade you in a heartbeat. So sometimes <laughs> what you don't love about yourself is what somebody else loves the most about you. You always want what you don't have. That's human nature. Isn't that funny? Mm -hmm. If somebody has, if you have short hair, you want long hair. If you have long hair, you want short hair. You know, it's exactly. just what it is. If somebody has blonde hair, you want blonde hair, you black hair. It's just vice versa. <laughs> I don't know why that is, but it's funny. It's like the same thing as we don't really care about what we have until it's gone sometimes and it's like this human nature to to constantly kind of go through that and so how do you work on a daily basis to really focus on what matters that is a really good question you know um, for me I recently went through some some turmoil some personal tragedy in my life that really helped me sort of refocus what was important and what wasn't um, I hope that other people can get to where I am today without having to go through that because it was not fun um, but I think, you know, when you, sometimes when you go through something, maybe, you know, it's an illness, maybe it's a death, maybe it's the loss of a job, whatever it is, sometimes something bad or traumatic has to happen to you to go, okay, it puts things in perspective, again, your favorite word. And, um, you know, I think really at the core, what's important is the people you love, your family, um, your, what is your moral compass? Really, you know, what what is the roadmap of your life that you want to walk, whether it's what society says is the path or not? I mean, you have to, I think you really have to be okay with marching to the beat of your own drum mm -hmm. and um, living with some intention. For me, that's, that's my new favorite word is intention. And I think that's really what I strive to do every day is wake up and say, for today, what is my intention? What do I want to achieve? What kind of person do I want to be? and not get too caught up in the big picture, not be too forward thinking about what is my life gonna look like next year, 10 years down the road. I'm just here for today mm -hmm. and I'm focused on now and I am finding that I'm a lot happier doing that because it's a lot more achievable mm -hmm. to work within a 24 hour time frame than it is to get really overwhelmed about what the next 50 years is gonna look like. It's profound. I like that. Yeah, and I, 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 I didn't make that up, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not laying claim to it. That's a lot of therapy right there, people. <laughs> By Cynthia Smoot. It's taken me a lot of therapy to get to that. I'm giving it to you for free. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I like the intention because I do think when you wake up in the morning, it is amazing. And that's what I do. When I'm kind of in that lucid part right before I'm about mm -hmm. to wake up, I, I really focus on intent because I can actually visualize myself for what I need to do. And it's like anything else in life, whether you're overcoming any sort of addiction or, or trying to be better in life, trying to take care of the family, responsibilities, taking that hour by hour makes so much more sense than saying, oh gosh, I got all this to do this month, next month, this year, where do I want to be at? And it gets overwhelming. And I think too that when we live in that moment, we choose wisely and, and, and we say everything right without even thinking about what we're saying you know how like when you're in a conversation with somebody and you, everybody's over there waiting to respond back because they already have their idea in their right. head those responses are normally never that good but it's that one that it, when it's just authentic and you're not even thinking about it and you and you say something because it comes from the heart and it's genuine and I think that's what matters that's another thing I'm working on is being a better listener mm -hmm. Um, you know, to your point, I'm always I'm always so quick to think like, well, I want to make sure I get my two cents in, and I want to be sure and get my opinion in. And what I found is sometimes when you hang back and you actually let other people talk, by the time it gets around to me giving you my two cents, I've already changed it because now I have more information, and actually what I can say is going to be more helpful, more constructive, because I've actually listened and gotten to what the problem or the concern is, instead of just jumping in and assuming I know what you're going to say or assuming I know what the problem is before I've even heard what you've presented to me. See, and I totally agree with that. I think that's awesome because and you can get a lot of information by other people asking questions. And I realized I don't have to be the one that asks. Yes. I used to be that person that thought, okay, if I ask, then I look really intelligent and smart. <laughs> but now I realize if I can just let everybody else ask all the frivolous questions or whatever, and then if I have anything to ask, then you right? can come in and be like, pow! <laughs> <laughs> My genius question. And then you out. really look like a genius. <laughs> I have a couple of kind of, kind of funny questions for you now. So okay. Like that. What's your spirit animal? What, if you had a spirit animal, what would it be? Um, mine would be a unicorn. Wow. Because this is a beautiful, mythical creature. Actually, if I could be anything, I would want to be Pegasus, the winged horse. Ooh. That's really what I would want to be. Because you can run. Because that horn kind of gets in your way, but I'd much rather have wings. <laughs> 
I could fly around and go anywhere, and that'd be awesome. <laughs> it's like a cape. A cape can get in the way sometimes, yes. you know. <laughs> I love that. See, you can run and you can fly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Are you ready to switch seats? Which seat? So she's gonna sit here in my seat. I'm gonna sit in the hot seat, and I have no idea, but she's gonna ask me some questions about my <laughs> life. And I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to ask. Nothing's been scripted, so we'll see. Um, I'm not really that scared, but I'm definitely open-minded, and I know that I'll be uh, having a new perspective. So, mm. are we ready? I think it's time for us to switch seats. Okay. see we have switched seats and Cynthia is sitting in my seat and I'm sitting in the hot seat and so I'm looking forward to the questions that you have to ask me. Um, ball is in your court. Well I love to be in charge so thank you. There you go. <laughs> yes ma'am. <laughs> so my burning question Ashley, let's kick this off by asking, um, as somebody who works as a professional therapist, do you have a problem in your real life relationships with your friend or your husband when they come to you, you've had a long day, you just want to chill out and have a cocktail? and all your friends want advice. <laughs> tell me how to fix my life. Let me tell you about my boss and how horrible they were today. That's an interesting question. Um, I do have it happen often. And a lot of times, if I'm not in the mood to talk, I'll just say, hey, I really love you and I care about you. Can we bring this up maybe tomorrow when I'm after my downtime because I had a really stressful uh, day? Uh, other times, you know, honestly, I feel good that I can offer help, you know? And so I, I don't want to take the whole night doing it, but at the same point in time, if it's only five, 10, 20 minutes, I'd rather help somebody get some perspective on their life and maybe help them, I don't know, kind of feel better and be able to say, you know, hey, I can make some changes in my life. Because I do find oftentimes that when people do ask you, they, they, they do need your help. And, and they, they do need some help and they need some guidance. And I know that if I ask somebody for any sort of input, I really need it and it's a timely it's a timely thing so I guess to answer your question I'm happy to do it most of the time it's just that one percent that I'll say can we defer this till tomorrow and on the flip side when do you start giving advice and your best friend says Ashley geez like I just wanted to tell you about my day I didn't ask for a therapy session not the I just wanted to vent on it <laughs> Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't want to actually do anything. I just want to. I just want to tell you about it. I've right. heard that before. What too. is that? That fine line between conversation and a session. A session. You know, it's funny because nowadays, because I work so much, I'm not giving out a lot of advice, and that's what's so funny about it. People will have to actually ask me because I've learned a long time ago. If somebody doesn't ask you for advice and you give it anyway, that's kind of your own meddling. Right. And also you can screw up your own karma that way. And so I normally just sit back and let people do whatever they want to do because I know that if I'm not asking for advice, I don't really want to hear someone else's advice. Do you feel that it's your job to tell people what to do or is it really letting them talk and guiding the conversation so that they come to the answer themselves? Secondly, yes, always. Yes, because, you know, I might have a certain perspective on it, but I'm not living it. Right. I might understand you, and I might have some guide points about it, but I want you to come to that assessment because when it comes back to it, you're making the decision. It's your life, and you've got to live with that life. It's not me having to go into that life. It's not me looking in that mirror every day. And so I want to be that sound, that, that just that sounding board, but also I might... Um, I might bring in some, some thought processes to think about, ask some specific questions that will connect with some things that either happened or some stuff that needs to happen, but I definitely don't want to push anybody to any side or the other. This sounds very much what I've been talking about with some friends as the mother of a 17-year-old about control versus influence and letting your teenager what's the word, individuate? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that so therapy is very similar to being a parent, it sounds like. It is. Because, like, when, you know, being a parent, you love your child and you want them to, you want the best for them, but sometimes they have to learn the hard way. Right. And I know I learned it the hard way when I was a kid. I mean, there were some things that, yes, I learned the easy way, but for the most part, the big things, I had to go through the process, I had to fall down, I had to pick myself up, I had to fall down again, and then say, you know what, this isn't the way I want to live my life. But if somebody was to tell me, oh, if you just don't do this, this, and that, your life's going to be perfect, I would have been like, no. Because I, I, you I either don't believe them or it just doesn't feel authentic. Yeah. And I think, it's, I think we all have to go through those growing pains, and we all have to deal with wasted youth. 
you can't have the life that you want when you're an adult until you've had wasted youth because you got to look back at those years and go, God dang it, I screwed up, you know? How could I screw up that bad? That's why they say the youth is wasted on the youth. See? They don't appreciate it. They don't. We look back, well, why couldn't I have been a certain way when I was 25 years old and right. figured it all out? Or if I know? had just had that butt now when I was 20. Exactly, exactly. Why couldn't I still have that? Why couldn't I be a genius, you know? Right. Well, we can't have it because it's, it's just the way it is. And I think that's where we learn and that's where our perspective comes from. From. And then we look back at it, and it's like it's funny because I have a lot of interns that are in high school and college. They have to go through the process, and I'll give the talks and I'll give you know some of the commentary. But in the end, they've got to make the choice because I know I did, right? You know, and I don't want to take that opportunity of wasted youth away from them. <laughs> That's right. Like everybody's got to go through it. That's you know? right. So I'm gonna switch gears on you a little bit. Okay. Earlier in our interview, you asked me what it was I loved about Texas because I write a lifestyle blog that's all about Dallas. Um, let me ask you, what is it about Dallas in particular, since this is where we live, that you love? What do you think separates Dallas from the rest of the United States or that makes you enjoy being a resident? I just like it because people are really real. I think that it's a great combination of folks from all races, all creeds that come together. I, I just feel like it's a place that you can be at home. I think it's a place that you can raise children. I think it's a place that... Um, epitomizes, um, you know, freedom of our country, you know, and, and I know that might sound like, you know, hokey, but I, I, I feel that way, and I feel, when I, when I walk around, I, I know a lot of people, I feel like it's a small town, and, uh, you know, honestly, it just feels like home, and there's definitely places that I love that have, you know, amazing mountains, and this and that, and Texas does have some amazing stuff. Now, Dallas, we don't really have the mountains, and we definitely don't have the ocean. But at the same, we point, have some amazing shopping. We do have shopping. We do food. We have amazing street. food. But I think the people make it, and I think that's what's so awesome about it, and that's what I get connected to because you can go all over, but when you're back at home, you're back at home. Absolutely. So I'm the mother of a 17-year-old. You are the mother to some fur babies. Oh yes. So tell me about your puppy, because you have a very unique breed of dogs. Yes, miniature bull terrier. I just think it's like the Budweiser dog. Yeah. Do you know that the Budweiser dog, do you remember um, Spuds McKenzie? Yes. Do you know that Spuds McKenzie was actually a female? I did know that. You knew that? Yes. Because I'm in advertising. Oh, yeah, yeah, you, you didn't do that. <laughs> and you know why they use the female, right? Because the males are so crazy. You know, they, they, they're just so like, they're just like bull in a china cabinet, you know? So they were just like, we can't use a male in this advertising. We'll never get the ad done. You but know? I think that's such an unusual breed of dog that you don't see very often. What was it about that particular breed that you're so drawn to? Because they're just so different. And, and they have this personality. I mean, and they even sit like we do. They sit like humans. They sit funny. I'll have to, I mean, if I could show pictures, I will. But it, they have that personality that's um, very hard-headed, very headstrong, um, very loving, very caring. And it, it's like you get that combination. And I, I love that combination because I don't want a total pushover. Right. You know, but I don't, I, but I don't want something that somebody or, you know, that's so, that's so demanding. But they're also smart, but they're funny. And so he doesn't bark. So if we're talking about Buddy, Buddy doesn't actually bark at, at people or dogs. Okay, he's very quiet. Even in the house, if somebody knocks on the door, rings the door, but he doesn't bark. Okay, the only time he barks is when he wants my attention. And one of the best times that he wants my attention is anytime I'm putting mascara on in the mirror, <laughs> and I'm like literally like, I'm like this, and you get right behind me, like, and I'm like. Oh. Damn it, buddy, you know? <laughs> Poke an eye out. I know. I'm like, what do you want? And he'll be like, hmm. And he's just kind of sneaky and funny, you know? And he's got those ways about him, and he'll run around on the bed, and he'll just and he'll just do his little run around, and, and he has fun. And it, and it and when you really get into yourself, like we've been talking about this, and you, and you really get, not from the spectator, but in your life, he's funny. I mean, he's super funny and lightens up the mood. And it's just like, man, how can you be stressed out with a dog like that that's just crazy as that? So, you know, they say dogs look like their owners. So does Buddy look like you or your husband? God, I hope he doesn't look like either one of us. Oh, my God. The big snods, you know? I mean, it's like a, it's like the big snods. You know, what are you going to do? I hope none of us. I hope we all don't have little eye patches and all that. But, you know, I, I think his personality, there's a little bit of me in that personality. You know, I have a little bit of that, you know, like the kidding, the comedian type side, you know, where I can make jokes and, and mess with people. And, and I think both, both Greg and I are kind of the same on that. But the looks, I hope to God that we don't look <laughs> <laughs> Now, you've chosen to live in downtown, which 
let's face it, Dallas is a suburban city. We, you know, we like our wide open spaces. That's part of our Texas DNA. And yet you are that city girl that's chosen to live in a high rise in downtown Dallas. What is it about downtown and city living that you love? You know, I just want to be in the middle of it. And I want to be in the middle of it where I don't have to do everything. So I just, I, I like, my whole life has been like that. Like I like to be in the middle of it, see it, but I don't have to be in it, but I'm right there and I can experience all of that at one time. And so I like being able to walk down the street and walk down the museums and take Buddy and do that. And I, and I like to be able to see the people. I like to see the folks that are leaving practice at the Black uh, Dance Theater. I like to see the folks leaving, you know, from the, from the opera. I like to see, um, the homeless people that I personally know, that I speak to every night that I see them and I, and I know about their background and why they were here and, and what happened to them and we actually communicate and we get to talk and I get to find out about the stuff that they're learning in ministry and what have you. So it's, it's just that, that whole combination that really, that I like and I don't, I don't think I would be able to find that um, it, in any different place. I don't think I could go find that up north or, or in the suburbs. I mean, I, I'm sure I couldn't find that. And, and I like that. And I like seeing like the man that walks down the street with the little ice cream thing and, you know, the little bells going. And I speak a very, a little bit of, um, uh, you know, muy poquito espanol, but I like to be able to have that conversation. <laughs> and those kind of things you can't make up, you know, and that to me is so cool. And it's, it's, I like it. Last question, five o'clock, the end of the day, you go home, you kick back, what's your cocktail of choice? <laughs> Usually kicking back about 8, 30, 9 o'clock at night, but I like the 5 o'clock, that would be awesome. Um, when I do kick back with a drink, I'll either have a glass of red wine or I'll have a kettle one club soda with a lime. Awesome. So after this interview, when we go out and celebrate the awesomeness that this is going to turn out to be, Perfect. drinks are on me. Hey, hey, you heard that right here on the Celebrity Perspective. Oh, I've had a blast with you today. This is great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for really having good. me. Well, I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad to do this show with you. This is amazing. I could talk to you for hours. I know. So anytime you get a cancellation, you call me, I'll be down. You got it. See, you heard that here, too, that she's going to come back. <laughs> she's, not, she's not scared of being here. She likes being mm -hmm. on the show, so that's an awesome thing. Not only will I, I'll give you my two cents plus ten more. Hey, I like that. Mm -hmm. I like that. So this is perfect. Amazing interview today with Cynthia Smoot. We have some amazing interviews coming up on the Celebrity Perspective Texas Edition. In the meantime, I want to thank Industrious here in downtown Dallas, right here at One Arts Plaza, for allowing us to shoot in their amazing lobby. And their amazing digs here are awesome. You got to check this place out at 1722 Ruth Street. And in the meantime, listen to your gut, find your true calling, and don't forget to live your true life today. <laughs>